Okay, uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are all set to start the first panel discussion of the day, the first session. So, uh, to be around our set and the key concerns around it, we have the distinguished panelists, and the session will be chaired by Dr. Ganesh Raja. So, without wasting any more time, let's get started and I request Dr. Raja to. Start the proceedings. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a, a, a piece de resistance on uh, RCEP uh, with the demise of the TPP uh, or discussions on TPP 11 uh, that are going forward. Um, RCEP has now become the main game in Asia and uh, its potential benefits are, are large um, and it involves the main economies in this region as well as India. And it could be really a beacon for liberalization uh, going forward, but there are also many challenges. Um, and to take these issues forward, we have an interesting panel. Uh, we have Deborah Elms from uh, the Asia Trade Center in Singapore. We have Amit and Dupalit from ISAS. And we have uh, Henry Wang from uh, the University of New South Wales. So what I've asked each of the uh, panelists is to speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, because their presentations are available, and uh, then we'll have some time for chat. Um, so, Deborah. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, let me just say there is no demise of the TPP. We will have to this November, so fantastic. Uh, let me talk about RCEP and the state of play in RCEP, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership here. This region, and because I am the first speaker on RCEP, I'm going to give some details on what's been happening in RCEP to set the stage for those of you who don't follow this regularly. RCEP has 16 members here in Asia, uh, all 10 members of ASEAN, plus what, what RCEP calls either the Dialogue Partners or the ASEAN Foreign Partners, AFPs China, Japan, Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand. So 16 parties here in Asia negotiating an agreement together. Why are we having an RCEP? RCEP came about for a variety of reasons, but one big one was alluded to earlier this morning, which is that there is a proliferation of trade agreements across this region, and in fact, an explosion of trade agreements at the regional level, at the bilateral level, uh, and it's been very complicated for businesses to operate in and around Asia. So that one of the goals driving RCEP is an attempt to rationalize some of this mess that we have found ourselves in here. Asia uh, to try to harmonize, we don't usually use the word harmonize in the context of trade, but, but the reality is we're trying to harmonize some of these rules, make them bigger, make them more regional, that's better for companies. Also to allow a trade agreement to help lock in domestic level reforms. We saw a lot of this on the TPP side, a little less of it on the RCEP side, partly because the rules in RCEP will be less deep and less comprehensive. It will drive less of domestic level reforms, but for some of the members, still, you can use RCEP as a mechanism for blocking domestic level reforms. It also encourages investment. One of the biggest deliverables of the RCEP process, and you'll see this when you see the, the content of RCEP, is a robust investment chapter, particularly inbound investment, and market access for inbound investors is quite expensive in RCEP, because they want FDI. All of the members want inbound FDI from other Asian countries. So to give investors confidence, to give them enthusiasm for Asia as a marketplace, we encourage that through RCEP. And have as much as possible, and here it gets a bit tricky, but some kind of standardized measures in areas to make it easier to trade across the region. And to build on existing agreements, existing ideas. So one of the things that the paper goes through that accompanies this is it tracks some of the earlier ideas that were sort of floating around prior to RCEP being RCEP. There was an idea from Japan called SIPA, which was essentially an ASEAN plus six initiative. So the same six countries, dialogue partners. There was also a rival idea of EFTA, which was ASEAN plus three, the Northeast Asian countries. These had been sort of floating around in the early 2000s, and they got converted, picked up and converted by ASEAN to become RCEP, uh, which is an ASEAN-centered initiative. So you'll often hear of RCEP as a China-led initiative and a China-led counter to these TPP, US-led TPP 
this narrative, if you learn nothing else from this discussion, you should get that RCEP is not a China-led initiative. RCEP is an ASEAN-led initiative, for better or for worse. Um, and it is not a China-led initiative. It's centered around ASEAN. And in particular, it's centered around what we call the ASEAN plus one agreements. So we have five existing ASEAN plus one agreements with China, Japan, Korea, India, and then a, a separate agreement with Australia and New Zealand as the fifth one. And the idea was you could take these five existing agreements, you could roll them all together, and a lot of them are set. Now the challenge with this, those of you who are theorists understand the sort of multilateralizing re regionalism argument, is that it's harder to do in practice than you think. So we have this great theory that says multilateralizing regionalism should be great. We just take these agreements and just spread them out. This is fantastic. Our set shows you why this is hard to do. And one of the reasons it's hard to do is that the base agreements themselves are quite different. And if you just look at market access for goods, you can see a lot of variation in the existing ASEAN plus ones, where only uh, about seven, about three quarters of the goods, tariff lines, are opened consistently across all of the ASEAN agreements. But a quarter of them may or may not be open. And that's from ASEAN to its dialogue partners. So that's a challenge. And you can see wide variations. ANSWTA with Australia New Zealand is by far the best agreement. ASEAN India is by far the worst agreement of the bunch. That's from ASEAN's perspective. The dialogue partners themselves, the six spokes, they have no agreement between them, between a lot of them. And in particular, what's missing is China India. And that is creating all sorts of problems on the RCEP side because when you have an RCEP, you are asking China and India to open up to one another. You're asking China and Japan to open up to one another. This is very complicated, especially on the market access for this side. In the ASEAN plus one commitments, there is almost nothing on services and very little on investment. So you're building on an unstable base in RCEP, and that's created all sorts of problems. We have a sort of noodle bowl. So this shows you the RCEP countries on the left, the TPP countries on the right. There are seven countries in common between them. And what I often get asked is, don't the TPP seven, four ASEAN countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam, plus Japan, Australia, New Zealand, don't the seven TPP countries push RCEP to be far more ambitious? Not so much. And in part, it's because the seven TPP countries in common have different negotiating teams. So they tend to send RCEP teams that have very little in common with the TPP teams. So they're different. Which means that the RCEP country teams show up focused on RCEP. They don't focus on TPP. They're different people with different objectives. They're focused on RCEP and not focused on TPP. We've had 19 rounds now in RCEP. The last round was last week in Hyderabad. Uh, we have one more round scheduled for this year in Korea in mid-October. The plan is to be, well, the plan, we had multiple deadlines come and go. Earlier ones were done. They should never have said they were going to be done earlier. This time, they sort of want to have an agreement that they can announce in November. It's ASEAN's 50th. It would be great if you could announce something at ASEAN's 50th. They will not be done this year. What they will probably have is some kind of framework agreement that they announce in November, because we're far from being done. Uh, two chapters are done, SMEs, but that's like a website for SMEs, and technical cooperation is the easy one. I mean, this is sort of the easy one to do. The, the, the key areas, there are about 15 substantive chapters underway now in RCEP. The key problem still is market access for this. This remains the sticking point in RCEP. We're only on the second round of tariff offers, so this is really simple. The rest of the agreement, though, is surprisingly good. I think, for given who's in it, given how complicated this is, services is moving along relatively well, especially compared to ASEAN agreements, much better. Investment, much better, because everybody wants investment. Other of what we used to call the 21st century issues, surprisingly good. IP is going well, competition policy is okay, customs is going fantastically well, I'm amazed. E-commerce, which is the thing that we've been working on forever, seems to be booming, although I think we're going to stuck at the end in China when it's put down as a big challenge. Um, it's been an issue. Stakeholder involvement has been a problem on the RCEP side. There is very little opportunity for others to participate in RCEP, and very little information gets out about what's going on in RCEP. And small companies are really going to struggle with getting information in and getting an agreement at the end of the day. That is <coughs> SMEs are important because all of the RCEP economies are SME heavy. For every
every single country in our sector. The lion's share of business is done by smaller companies. So if you don't make agreements to end the day that benefits smaller companies, it's going to be problematic. The best agreements for SMEs is not to have a chapter on SMEs. The best agreement for SMEs is to have one that is deep and broad, that has tariff cuts that are significant, that makes it easy to the services, that has a robust e-commerce chapter, because most SMEs will operate in e-commerce, digital, et cetera. And so if you don't get the basic rules, if you don't have easy to use customs, then SMEs will struggle to use this agreement. So it needs to be a, a user-friendly kind of agreement in order for SMEs to benefit. Having a chapter that allows a website is not going to be for SMEs. It's not going to be TPP. And so comparing our set to TPP is really unfair to both agreements. Uh, it's not TPP. It, it doesn't have the same rules. It doesn't have the same access to commitments. The better thing to do really is to compare our set by things about ASEAN commitments. So if you could, you know, TPP is here, our set is going to be here, ASEAN is down here. So comparing it to ASEAN, I think, is better. Then it looks better. Um, then it's more ambitious. I think it's more ambitious because the way that our set negotiates is that in every round, in every chapter, ASEAN has a caucus, and ASEAN 10 have to get together and decide what do we think. They usually come out of every chapter and every round, and they say, we have no idea what we think. We're waiting for the AFPs to tell us what we think. Then the AFPs come in and they tell ASEAN what they think, and then they move forward one more round, and then they come back together next round, and the same thing starts again. So it's an incremental, slow, painful process, but we're moving ahead slowly and painfully. And by next year, I think we'll have the agreement finished. But it is difficult and it's challenging because of the process involved here. Um, because it's ASEAN led and because the proposals are slow, you've got to get 16 incredibly diverse countries to come together on 15 challenging topics. It's hard. Um, and that's going to be, that's really the sticking point here in our country. So where are we from now? Just to, to wrap this up and again, we'll take lots of questions again. Plan is to finish with a, some sort of framework. We're running out of time. We have the ministers meet in September, the trade ministers meet in September. The trade ministers need to get some basic understanding as much as they can about what can be done realistically between now and November. And in particular, they need to line up the sensitive issues that leaders have to resolve in November. Crucial among those is what are we going to do on market access and goods? How much market access do we have to have among the members? Because we are still 19 rounds in fighting over how much market access do we have to give? This is a bit nutty. We started these negotiations a very long time ago, and we're still arguing over how much market access do we have to give in goods in terms of tariff lines and percentage of trade. Crazy to be still at this argument, but that has to be resolved. And if that's not resolved, we'll never close our system. So that has to be resolved by the government. We also have to, part of that is also tied to services level access. And those two things have to be set by the tariff trade ministers in September and then agreed upon by the leaders in November. And it can't just be a cosmetic discussion. It has to be, we have to confront some real decisions. You can't keep sweeping this under the carpet. You have to actually, you know, this is it. Like, you either get serious or you stop. But you can't keep spending all this money to send 700 officials to far-flung places year after year without getting anywhere. So this is the sort of time in which it has to be decided. So we have the September is the trade minister's meeting. There's a round in October in which the technical level officials will do what they can to clean up as much as possible. The leaders will meet in November. In the Philippines, they should, I think, announce a framework agreement. My guess is that they will be able to say this is the above outlines of where we're headed. And then if all of that is set, we should be able to close it next year. So we're close. It's not like this is a never-ending thing, as I think, having now gone to run around the row. I would like to not do this forever. Uh, but it's going to require some hard decisions that need to be taken now, because we can't have another 19 months without being able to sort through aggregating barrier on, t on goods in particular. Uh, and then once that gets resolved, then the rest of this agreement will be relatively quickly. But you have to be realistic in our sense. It's not going to be a TPP level quality, but I don't think it's, it's a pointless exercise. It does have real benefits. It has benefits for companies. 16 countries in Asia are amazing. And particularly for companies, all of the problematic countries in Asia are in one room. So if we can get anything locked in in our set, that's fantastic. So setting the basic rules of the game across this region, fantastic. The potential is there. 
the groundwork is in play. We just need to lock this thing down and get it done by the end of next year. So that's where we are in our state. And Singapore, we know, is the host next year. So there's a lot of pressure riding on Singapore to actually get this stuff done next year. So, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, now we have uh, Amitendu on a GP's answer. Thanks, Ganesh. And uh, following uh, Debbie's presentation of ASIP, what uh, I'll discuss here is, uh, I, I would call it a cynical assessment, but I, I'd like to uh, address a couple of issues regarding ASIP. The first is that uh, there is a great deal of conversation with respect to the ASIP, particularly after the setback received by the TPP. Uh, the TPP is uh, definitely going to come back, maybe not in the way it was uh, envisaged earlier. But following what happened to the TPP, the ASIP was kind of taken as the savior of free trade and regional trade, at least in the Asia Pacific. Now, to that extent, there's a great degree of uh, uh, resonance in whatever the ASIP is able to do in terms of the sake and story of free trade. But if we look at it from another perspective, how much of gains in economic terms and trade can the ASEAN actually produce? I'm afraid I'll sound uh, sort of cynical about this. And the reason for that is very simple. I think the ASEAN focus, as uh, Debbie mentioned in points that she discussed, the ASEAN focus now is primarily on agreeing on a shield of tariff liberalization and go and get it done as fast as possible. I'm not too sure whether that's going to give ASIP the kind of growth and trade opportunities that it could have got. Had it tried to be a little more ambitious, patient, and persuasive in addressing far more serious market access barriers than tariffs. And I specifically focus on non-tariff barriers in this. And by the way, I must uh, 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 sort of share this right at the beginning. This is not a this is not an India perspective. This is an overall ASIP perspective when we look at NTEs, but we can discuss India in the context. Now, this story looks at the prevailing sanitary and phytosanitary measures, which are a part of the non-tariff barriers. And for those of you who may not be aware of what SPS mentions, non-tariff barriers and trade balance comprise uh, two forms. One are the SPS, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, which countries maintain for ensuring that imports into them cannot damage the health of plant and animals and humans into their country. The other form of non-tariff areas are technical areas to trade, which again set for the standards which would protect emission, environment, ecology, and so on and so forth. So we are basically looking at plant, animal, human health, and environmental safety. And these are all coming out of national concerns. But when these standards come up, often they become barriers for a large number of uh, exports, and particularly from the developing world, where exports are not always capable of being ensured that they reach those standards that the developed country markets would expect from them. And uh, interestingly, we, we have seen over the last 15 years that protectionism in the world of trade has undergone a change in character. Earlier it used to be protectionism primarily through trade. The WTO first and the regional agreements later have brought down the tariffs in a fairly uh, sort of coordinated and substantive fashion, but the slant of protectionism has shifted more to non-tariff ways, slowly. Now, what we see over here is, uh, is the situation with respect to sanitary and phytosanitary measures that are maintained by the 16 economies of the ASIP. There's a total of 570 
out of the work that we have done so far on RCEP, and these are all from the WTO database. There are, I am very sure, more measures which are not notified to the WTO. And if you take a look at uh, the countries, I think, let me uh, read out the countries for those of you who may not be able to uh, see this very clearly. The three top maintainers of SPS measures, number one, Philippines, 142. Number two, New Zealand, 88. I'm sorry, number three is New Zealand, 88. Number two is China, 190. And between them, these three countries actually account for more than 60% of the sanitary and phytosanitary measures that are maintained by the ASEAN countries. Now moving on to TBTs, technical barriers to trade. 393 measures. Oh, sorry. I changed, I changed my language. Sorry. 393 measures, technical barriers to trade. Top 104, China. Second, Republic of Korea 77. Third, Japan 59. Again, between the three of these, they account for 60% of the TBT measures that are in vogue in the ASEAN. When we look at the story in totality, almost a thousand measures between SPS and TBTs across the ASEAN, known only to the WTO. Known only to the WTO and to the rest of the world. There could be many which are not known to the WTO and which function as market access barriers. We have not been able to capture that in this database, but our numbers uh, come up to more than 950 when we look at the total SPS and TBTs. And uh, the largest chunk of these, around a quarter, are maintained by China. The second is Philippines. Philippines overwhelmingly high because of SPS. Surprisingly, Philippines has very low TBTs. It's very high on SPS. Uh, there's Korea, there's Japan, there's Indonesia. Well, uh, the interesting part now comes in. And let me straight away move to the summary. The highest entities are in China along with Korea, Philippines, New Zealand and Japan. Now, the interesting part is, apart from Philippines, the remaining countries are all non-ASEAN members of ASEAN. I think this is an interesting point to note. And within ASEAN, except for Philippines, the entities are not very high. So if you look at the N group of Southeast Asian economies, characteristically, Singapore, Malaysia have been among the lowest imposers of SPS and TBTs. Thailand has been maybe relatively among the higher ones, but no way as large as the non-ASEAN countries. And among the non-ASEAN members of ASEAN, the relatively low ones are Australia and India, when it comes to SPS and TBTs. At least again in terms of the term two numbers. And by the way, we have been talking about LDCs low-income countries, no TBTs for LDCs in ASEAN, except one by Cambodia. Poor Cambodia has been able to surface in the database by imposing one measure on TBT. Nothing from Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam. Uh, sorry, nothing from Laos and Myanmar as of now in the LDC. Now, it's not really very surprising that entities would be high in Japan, Korea and New Zealand because all three are OECD countries, and there is a parity in their quality standards when it comes to the OECD standards with respect to uh, plant and animal and human and ecological safety. So these standards are compatible to a large degree in terms of the sensitivity they impose on import requirements. And this is probably one of the reasons why it is, in a sense, easier to settle SPS and TBT conclusively between OECD countries because there's a degree of standard compatibility. So for example, it didn't come up as an issue when the EU and Japan negotiated an FTA between them. It, it was hardly an issue. It, it, there was a degree of compatibility in the standards. But the point is, why are entities in China so high? Presumably for two reasons. A, there's a domestic reason. 
The domestic reason is that over the last eight years, China has become more and more sensitive to food quality standards within itself. And this started off from an infant milk order scandal in 2009. It subsequently developed more and more specific dimensions and the areas where the standards have largely spread are with respect to food additives and the use of chemicals in various imports that are coming into the country. But I think we need to upfront accept the fact that China is among those countries which have rather low tariffs on its agriculture. This was a major concession that it made when it joined the WTO, but it has increasingly probably shifted to non-tariff barriers as a form of providing protection to its domestic agriculture sector. So you get to see this proliferation of entities. Now, the point is, what does all this mean? So you slash tariffs. 92%, 93%, whatever high ambition, moderate ambition goals are achievable, fine. Then what happens? Does market access improve? I mean, today, for example, if New Zealand slashes from 92 to 93, 91 to 91.5, does it mean that there's a great degree of additional market access that is automatically guaranteed? Of course not. Of course not, because those preferential tariffs would not allow automatic access unless and until the imports satisfy the quality standards. So this is the challenge. The challenge over here is now that can the RCEP bring down these NTPs? And unfortunately, this is here, I have to strike a cynical note. Why do I strike a cynical note? A, RCEP's obsessive compulsion and focus is on tariffs. It seems to be a totally tariff-driven agreement. I mean, there are of course other issues that are being taken up by the working groups, those are being discussed, but as of now, the focus seems to be on the fact that if somehow or other a common tariff schedule can be agreed upon, that will be a great achievement. I'm not too sure if there is discussion going on on the entities. And the reason for that is very simple, because ASEP doesn't want to become an instrument which will agitate the domestic constituencies of its members. The moment you have to address the NTPs, you have to get into domestic quality requirements, quarantine requirements, safety of plant and animal and health and so much of so forth of domestic regulations, and ASEP doesn't want to stay beyond borders, because that has never been the tradition of ASEAN FTAs. ASEAN FTAs have steered clear of controversies that would agitate the domestic constituencies. And the result of this is that ASEAN FTAs typically have weak SPS and TBT chapters. Let me just very briefly allude to the TBT. One of the things that the TBT did in its SPS and TBT chapters was A, to define what fundamentals the SPS and TBT should be based on scientific risk assessment. All EU FTAs have a benchmark for defining SPS and TBTs. The second thing that the TPP tried to do, and this was an extremely ambitious objective, was to harmonize standards, quality standards among the members, so that the standards between all members reflect the uniformity. ASEP is not going to go anywhere like that. It's too much of work. And by the time it reaches this, ASEAN would have crossed 60 years, 70 years, 75 years. As it is, APEC itself has not been successful in harmonizing standards. I mean, there's probably some movement that has happened with respect to the ASEAN economic community and food standards, but that's only limited. So, as a result of that, there is not going to be any teeth or substance in the SPS and TBT chapters which this grand agreement is going to produce. So, three years later you will have domestic constituencies coming back and telling people that what happened because of this FTA? We are exactly where we stood before. So why did you open the doors to tariffs? We remain as bad or as good as we were before because we don't get access. Imports come into our country, our exports don't get access anymore. So looking ahead, I'm sorry to be cynical but that I think is the story. Tariff cuts might not increase trade as, and this is again a totally asset perspective, and lest you think that I am 
getting into an India-China complication in this regard, let me assure you that India's top exports face, among the ASEP countries, the lowest SPS barriers in China. They face the highest SPS barriers in Philippines, Japan, and Korea. Because, again, for your information, Indian exports which Meet the maximum barriers in these countries are meat and bovine meat. I don't want to talk too much about bovine meat in today's circumstances, but meat, bovine meat, uh, medicines, these three. Hardest barriers to cross Philippines, Korea, New Zealand, and Japan. So, this is not an India China story that I am trying to build up by criticizing us, but all that I am saying is that there is an agreement. This would not reach its goals unless the entities are addressed. And now this is where I really, really want to emphasize on this. What is the ASEP wanting to do? A quick end by agreeing on tariffs would get it a low quality deal and an unproductive deal. It might serve symbolism, that's a different issue. But it's not going to get a high quality deal. Now, as it is, nobody was expecting ASEP to be radically high quality, but I don't think. This is going to do justice to the users of ourselves, the potential users. Because unless the entities are addressed, the story is going to remain as bland or bleak or black as it was before. Thanks. I'm going to thank you very much. Um, uh, and man, uh, we're going to talk about investment rules. Um, can you do this in about 15 minutes? Which is perfectly on time to chat. Thank you. First, I'm very beginning to the ISIS for the and also online for inviting me here. It's my great privilege. And today I'd like to talk about the uh, little issue of the RC, focusing more on the investment rules. Uh, the reason why uh, I look at from a, a sign of a sim is that because that, as indicated earlier, if you look at China and India in particular, they don't have actual uh, FTA among themselves. In the reality, they want to have they have an investment agreement and also investments in one area where a lot of consensus has been made that it won't make it happen. So I would choose this one because we really have some uh, rules where we can build upon that. So basically two questions. Uh, one, I could analyze what's the approach of the investment um, agreements, where means the China ASEAN uh, investment agreements. And secondly, what are the major issues if ASEAN would like to develop from that perspective? And I will first look at the models of China's FTA and then to see Uniqueness of China ASEAN investment agreement, the approach of this agreement, and finally the legal issues that may encounter in the RCA. Um, so basically, um, due to time constraint, I know I have a 15 minutes one. Um, so it's about, uh, I think it's the investment is quite special uh, from China's perspective, because China is basically uh, very active in promoting outbound investment, uh, although they have some uh, regulation increased. Uh, outbound investment, particularly by private enterprises. And also China wants to attract uh, inbound investment. And the second one, that China already has all FT, uh, has the investment agreement with all the massive uh, parties. And also the second point is that the China ASEAN FTA is special for China because China basically shows much more flexibility uh, if we understand the countries China and RCM. But on the other hand, if we move from RCM to RCM, and you see that the story may be different, because on point one, it involves more than investment. It's not, as indicated by our policy earlier, market access will be different from, for goods, be different from what happened in investment, where it's easier to reach agreements on investment. On the other hand, more importantly, China's uh, extra flexibility is shown in ASEAN. But nowadays when you see the negotiating table, they have ASEAN, they have India, where they don't have actual FTA at all. So let's be much more uncertainty on that. And then, let's first start with the models of China's FTA uh, in terms of investment. So category could be made at least for three types of them. The first one is China ASEAN investment agreements. So basically, their features are relatively comprehensive, but they're generally limited uh, requirements. You, know, you see 
scheme, for example, investment protection, it's quite lower level if you compare with the um, other FTA like China Korea FTA, which we'll discuss later. So that does category involve China ASEAN FTA, includes China New Zealand FTA. Even if uh, New Zealand FTA is higher than the ASEAN one, but still remain quite leading in their requirements. The second or the highest level among Chinese investment work on FTA is China Korea FTA. So basically it's really more comprehensive, the detailed and, and important strict provision. And they are understandable because they are largely affected by the US practice. Because of China basically follow the LAFTA approach. And on the other hand, for Korea, they already conclude the chorus, the Korea US agreement. So it's easy that they bring the same pattern to China. And China in reality largely rely on the proposal of the of their partners. The third one is China Australia FTA. That's a work in progress uh, type of agreement because Australia is quite cautious due to the plain packaging case. So you see that we have short form investment rule, and they have a focus more on investment state dispute. They're very cautious about maintaining the regulatory autonomy. So that's the third category. And among them, China are seen uh, investment rates, which I use as short term of investment rates. It's quite special because the China RCFTA FTA in general is the only FTA China conclude with more than one economy. It's no longer a bilateral one, it's multinational. I kind of, if you call the number of parties, a multinational in that sense. And second, it helps understand the position of RCFTA China. Um, in, to, especially when we understand RCFTA negotiation, you see where they start at the very beginning. And, and also, don't forget RCFTA China FTA has been upgraded um, in 2015, although the progress is very limited. And certainly, the investment agreements has a wider implication because they will coexist with RCA. And they will coexist also with the China Single FTA and China Single FTA, for example, incorporate the China RCA investment agreements. So they are kind of unique. That's for us to understand this rule. And next, if we look closer to see the investment agreements, here I mean China RCA investment agreements, you basically see that one of the major features of flexibility. So basically, uh, you see that they have a not common practice where the investment rules include country-specific rules. I want those detailed ones. Just by example, they have a delay of benefits right, for Thailand. So it's just required if you do not come from, the investors does not come from Thailand, you are not, benefit, not able to benefit from the investment agreements. In other countries of ASEAN, you have to not only prove that you are not from the RCN, uh, sorry, the FTA country, but also you do not operate substantial business activities. So in Thailand one, you have a lower level, it's easier to exclude the benefits of businesses. So that's one of the flexibility on the demand of the Thailand. And, last, and also, there are other specific rules, but the reason why we will ask the way of flexibility is because China largely follows on and build up on the proposal of FTA partners. So not only ASEAN, if you look at China's FTA with Peru and China's FTA with Pakistan, you see the FTA is a totally different style. There's no templates as the US there. And they, so you see that actually, if you look at investment agreements between China and ASEAN, they basically fall at the very beginning the framework agreement on us invest area as a template. And later when they finish the investment agreement, they largely mirror the RCN comprehensive investment agreements, except for market access provision. Because RCN basically argues strongly for market liberalization. China will generally take the partner's proposal, but China found difficult to swallow the investment liberalization until recently. China agree with the, the states on the bilateral investment treaty because U.S. remains the country which can effectively influence China, although the U.S. influence has decreased in that sense. Yeah. And also, the second reason for that is investment agreement is a last step for China and ASEAN to establish the FTA. They already come with framework agreements, the trade goods, and um, and also a uh, dispute resolution. And they want to put investment to make the FTA cover. That's kind of as a 
a symbolic one, the political uh, 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 benefit for that as well. And then, let's look at the same other feature. The other feature also includes ones like the less rigorous or developed rule. So generally speaking, that's the China of Sin investment rule, or quite low level ones. So example will be that if you compare with other Chinese FTAs or investment agreements, in particular the China Korea FTA, there are narrow scope of investment. So for example, they exclude those in investment which are not consistent with domestic policy. They are not covered. In other traded FTA, they are covered. And also weaker investment uh, treatment. They don't refer to customer very international law, where you can find other FTAs from China, like recent one. The lenient rules about long conforming measures. So they are very general. They don't really give very stringent requirements on what you cannot adopt for regulatory measures on investment. And there are narrow scope for ISDS. So there only are special categories of treatment or provision where you can an investor. ISDS here means investor state dispute resolution. You can initiate that. While if you look at Korea, China FTA, then basically everything should be covered for investment. So they are very careful about how you can initiate this. And also, interesting enough, China now increases, uh, increasing uh, being the target for ISDS. And the third approach is that incremental strategy, which is also kind of uh, common in China's FTAs, but more obvious for ASEAN one. A typical example is that China accepted ASEAN's progressive FTA approach. So if you compare China's FTA with ASEAN, these are the Japan's FTA with ASEAN. So they don't really take a, a one package, single package to cover everything as a final agreement. It takes a progressive one, starting from framework, goods, and services, this resolution, and then finally investment. So that's basically China follow the progressive pattern, and also build up on ASEAN model as we indicated earlier, the bonds proceed. And also, such trend occurs or will remain at least even nowadays. If you look at the upgrade of China RCFTA, China RCFTA is the first FTA China upgrade. They still remain quite some slow progress. For example, investment. The old rule between China and ASEAN focus on investment protection. Not about investment liberalization, only look at how we protect you. We do not really talk about elective things you know, for investment open up. And upgrading protocol remain the same. They say that we will move on for future discussion on investment liberalization. What the cost so that shows a very slowly progressive or incremental approach. One of the reasons for that is they wait until original China US beat by that investment treaty negotiation. But now given the Trump change and stop of the negotiation, they may wait until for example China EU by that investment treaty, see how it works before they move on to RC. So finally, very quickly, legal issues, RC investment rules. Uh, I found it's very risky to to prevent to predict what happens in the future, so I keep it short. Uh, but I have to take questions. Why is market access? Uh, so basically, ASEAN locks um, investment liberalization. China is also more positive about that because China will already, already take that as a basis for U.S.-China beat negotiation. So whether open question whether ASEAN will be able to take effective or pre establishing the national treatment. Yeah, they will do that, yeah. So that's the one of the aspects they can do so. Yeah. Another issue is about the substantial provisions, about how do you define investment scope and investment treatment. Um, how do you phrase the words about FET if you want to take that, and also the full protection and security, whether you take that, and how do you frame that, and also the social issues. The environmental issue will be difficult, yeah, because environmental issue can be a special chapter on FTA. You could also have an environmental provision in the investment rule, saying that China takes some of that in the FTA with Korea, that we will attract investment, not at the cost of degrading the environment protection. But that's to be phrased in a best endeavor, a shoe instead of shell, it's not really binding. 
And also another issue about transparency, whether it is way easier to do that. And also the taxation potential measures. So you will see whether there will be soft approach or hard work, whether it be binding or not binding. And also whether it, how much and whether and how much you protect regulatory autonomy. As an example would be the TPP, the Australia Argent for Tobacco Platform. And it's interesting to see that how regulatory autonomy can be protected in the RC, if at all. And then finally you have the issue like RSDS, Investor State Dispute Resolution. And China has, as much earlier as we keep on receiving more disputes. And also whether you want the guidance on interpretation of the rules. Uh, although the EU proposed the investment appeal system, the Invest International Investment Tribunal, I guess it would be too early for our city to take that. But it would be interesting to see whether they keep the possibility open uh, in, in, as, a, as a future area for discussion. So to conclude, that I'd like to say that uh, we have two slides here. One is that investment rules for China FTAs vary with partners and reflects a pragmatic approach. So China's FTA, the, the Chinese pattern is no pattern. It's a pragmatic um, and, um, approach. So China may play an active role in RC. Um, then in investment terms, they are interested in the, in the investment protection, but will facilitate early conclusion. But China, I believe, that is not a leader at all for RC negotiation. In reality, China won't, don't, don't want to be a roadblock for the realization of RC, unless it's been sensitive issue, SOEs or data flow, that's how they store it. But generally, we want to make that happen. The same story already happened. If you look at WTO with the trade facilitation agreement, China basically uh, promotes that and what that happened. And the second one, a large number of RC parties bring a lot of uncertainties and difficulties. So for example, we see that on one hand, Australia is cautious regarding RSDS because of the plant packaging case. On the other hand, India seems to be hesitant to incorporate investment charter in the FTAs. In particular, if you look at India's model of bid, although people argue India's model of bid may not be really in the real position of the government eventually, but you still see a large deviation from the previous one if you look at the exhaustion of local remedies for at least five years, and they don't include an MF and close investment. So it's interesting to see that even we call investment it's easier, as indicated by Deborah earlier, that invest, everyone won't have inflow or out of the FDI. But still remain to see how can you bridge the difference about the ISDS or and other areas. So it's difficult to negotiate that. Um, can be seen, for example, between ASEAN and Japan, which was concluded in last year. So, so that will be an even difficult for binary one, let alone 16 party uh, getting involved. Final page. Um, a lot of questions remain open. One, will RC simply upgrade, consolidate, or streamline previous rules? So what's the approach it take? Or RC will take short form and work in progress type of rules and move forward for investment liberalization or stringent investment protection in the future. So that's been another option. And third one, how RC may contribute to the or convergence or divergence of laws. Finally, the RCIP will carry the enormous implication. So will RCIP contain innovation provisions? And actually, uh, what impact can it have on future negotiation on other FTAs? So for example, they have a huge implication for China, if China move on with claiming China FTAs. And, and also us already move forward on Chinese older FTA in terms of the separate chapter on small and medium enterprise for China. Before. And also, we also serve as a potential pathway if we want to go to the free trade area of Asia Pacific, if the 16 party get involved. If properly managed, RC will substantially contribute to the convergence of international investment rules because they may possibly have, we already have the major players, the critical mass. We have the US, we have the China, we have the EU. But the US now is problematic in promoting that. RC, where President said huge economic area, may help to build up critical mass and to establish a consensus or a kind of build for that. And the Ukraine Council will be very much welcome and thank you so much.
Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for all the panelists for having stuck to roughly their 15 minutes. Um, we'll open the um, session for questions in a minute, but I'm going to just pose a couple of questions to each panelist, and then by all means uh, respond to these and any more that come to the close. We'll have one round, and then if we have time, we'll go another round. That is for final proposal, so that we get a chance for anyone to say things that they, they may like to say. Uh, so please note the questions and note answers to it. Uh, give each of you a chance in turn uh, to try to answer them. Um, for Deborah, uh, Deborah, you were straightforward about the timelines for our set. I noticed you said this would take a long time. So the question for you, one question for you is, is the era of big agreements like our set over? Um, so that's the question for you. And should we be thinking more bilaterally in the future? Uh, a second question, I was a bit puzzled, um, and I wonder if you could clarify. The simulation modeling I have done, and others have done, like Salim and others, show that the TPP without the Japan-US agreement, the core of it, doesn't make any sense. And so just the smaller countries, the economic gains. So the question for you is, does the TPP-11, uh, while I can see the politics of it, make any sense in economic terms? So that's the question for you. Uh, for Amit Tendu, um, Terminology, NTB versus NTM. I, I recall earlier on the WTO had these clear definitions as, as well as others. So NTB is that you know is quantitative restrictions. Uh, the NTM concept is a broader thing that includes the things you're talking about. So the first question is you know, definition. I just wonder, it's something you may want to look into as we provide your paper. The question is what measures, you know, DBT and SPS and so on. Is it that kind of talking about? So specify the sources, the several sources use, uh, then you might want to do something, uh, as you're a brilliant economist and a friend, I would put you to say, can you carry the equivalents of some reason, uh, or begin to start unpacking this, because otherwise your head counts don't make sense to me. The last question is, what kind of national level actions are needed to tackle this NTP or NTM issue? Um, so at the level, we may get something. Um, to um, Dr. Wang, um, we talked about China's investment provisions evolving over time, and that's encouraging. So we have from the early days, so China's kind of learning how to do this. Um, is China going to get to a stage in its um, investment rules, basically, willing to do so? Get to China and you will it. What would that take? Just a question for you all to do. Um, second, it's investor state dispute settlement. I wonder if you can tell us under what kind of law would China be comfortable with? So let's open the floor up and then just take that set of questions and then I'll give each of you a chance to respond and we'll have a second one. Uh, anybody from the floor? Uh, uh, please, if you can give your name and, and, and your question as briefly as possible, please, so we have time for chat. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ankush from ISAS. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is for Dr. Ems. Uh, about two weeks ago, the Indian High Commissioner to Singapore uh, wrote an op-ed in the Straits Times about the RCEP. And while he was mostly positive about it, towards the end he very clearly stated that the way forward for RCEP, the partners have to recognize that services is equal to trade in goods. Trade in services is equal to trade in goods. So I was just wondering if you could shed some light on whether the most recent negotiations have addressed this or what the partners have uh, perhaps agreed on or what they feel about this. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, please, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Ganesh. I have a question for Andy. And for the technical barriers to trade, I assume SPS is mostly agriculture. For the technical barriers of trade, are they almost all concentrated in agriculture as well, or do they spread across many sectors? Um, please. Professor, and then uh, both of you raised your hand at the same time, so uh, I'm going for geography first. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, the question is for Prof. Heng. Uh, Prof. Heng, I was taken in by this uh, metaphor of a rudal bowl of uh, agreements that uh, Dr. Elms used. And listening to you, I've got two um, questions uh, that emerged for me. First, um, as a layman, when you look at a rudal bowl, you see that they sort of cut into one another. So a country can be a member of a number of organizations. What does the country do? If the organization is concerned, 
don't have the same norms, for example, norms of hygiene, when it comes to agricultural goods. Can it then feel free to take the best, or is it stuck to the hardest of those norms? So one country as a member of several organizations, where the norms of good practice that they use are in contradiction with one another. That's one question, um, it's a legal question. The second question is, every organization is a closed shop. I mean, if you have 16 people, then the 17th person is kept out. What happens if India, uh, which is a member of RCEP, also has a membership of South Asia Free Trade Area, SAFTA, or Bumstek? Can it then take advantage of the membership of one group to share those privileges with another South Asian country, um, let's say Nepal or Bhutan, which is not a member of that group. So can it do a little bit of side business? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of observations and questions. Uh, one, of course, we will... Could you, could you keep them to questions? Yeah, so yeah. We'll get a good okay, discussion. Okay, yeah. So, uh, in fact, uh, we were in Hyderabad together for the RCEP for 19,000 negotiation, which brought over on 28. Uh, I agree with uh, Devara, which was said that uh, tariff negotiation is going too long. That is, 19,000 negotiation, we are nowhere close to the finishing line. Normally, in any trade agreement, four or five rounds, we cover a lot of ground and tariff negotiations. But the problem here is what has happened that, uh, from India particularly, uh, because we have negotiated in the ASEAN FTA also, there also we went for first goods agreement, then later on we struggled to negotiate the investment services agreement. And that is the actually happened in case of RCEP also. Initially, some of the countries were very keen to but go ahead. Can come to your question, please? Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, so, th so that did not, that's why India, in fact, the So, Pranav, what is the question, please? Well, the questions are, it's no, more so, so we need, we need a question, please. I'd like to conduct the session so we have sharp exchanges. So please. Okay, so, question? so, uh, what exactly you think if we have to go for the, Balanced negotiation, good services and investment. It is going to happen, or we are still more confined and more focused on the only tariff negotiation. Because tariff negotiation, anyway, will not take you too far. For instance, many of the LDCs they have new uh, tariff all over the world, and they have not integrated themselves to the global economy. So, if you have to really talking about economic integration, we have to focus on all three pillars of market access, goods, investment, and investment. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have uh, one question each for, for each of the panelists. Uh, to Deborah, uh, you mentioned Singapore is likely to conclude the RCEP negotiation in 2018. Uh, what kind of compromises do you think Singapore will request the other 15 countries to make to conclude the FTA in 2018? Uh, my second question uh, to Prof. Heng, uh, you have looked in detail the ASEAN-China uh, agreement. Have you seen ASEAN's own agreement, the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement? Because that agreement mainly talks about promotion and protection, not much of liberalization like you have mentioned. In your. So I would say for RCEP, can ASEAN be a model for RCEP because it's ASEAN-led? and. Uh, to Dr. Amitendu, you um, uh, spoke about SPS and TBT. I think in RCEP, the ASEAN countries are not looking for SPS and TBT. They are calling it a trade facilitation chapter. I think they probably know it better. And so, how do you see the SPS TBT in the overall trade facilitation measures for, uh, for the RCEP negotiation? And the Sub question is you you're talking about the headcount of SPS TBT. How much of these are the bilateral among the RCEP member countries? Can we have a uh, like some discussion on that? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's start with Deborah, please. Okay. Clearly, we don't have enough information about RCEP uh, because RCEP is actually not just on tariff negotiations. Thank goodness, or we get nowhere. It is, it is a comprehensive trade agreement. We are negotiating on goods, services, investment. There is negotiations on SPS. There are negotiations on TBT. It's not called TBT in ASEAN. It's called straight cap, which is 
standards, technical assessments, and conformity assessment, or something like stray cat, whatever it is. So there are working groups on SPS and on stray cat. We have been putting in policy briefs to the officials at every round to give them suggestions on what we think should be done on standards. Precisely actually to go to the professor's point about um, how do you help companies use trade agreements because the era of big deals should not be over. Bilateral trade agreements are a disaster for companies. No one in this global economy operates in two countries. No one does this. Even the smallest firm doesn't operate in just two countries anymore. You need to have a trade agreement that operates in the widest possible space, preferably globally, but since that's not working, regionally is best. So you need to have an agreement that has rules that cover as much as possible. And in standards in particular, you really need international standards. We don't need domestic standards. That's a disaster for firms. You need standards that are international, you need to be able to use them as much as possible across the widest possible space. You need SPS and TBT rules that are regional, so that you then can manufacture products, goods, etc., to meet regional rules, whatever those happen to be. Will RCEP do that? It's a little unclear, but note that RCEP is negotiating on both SPS and TBT. Um, I would argue for on the to be careful with the MTBs. You don't notify, I think a lot of countries don't notify to the WTO if you don't have the capacity to notify, and LDCs are not required to notify WTO. So the fact that LDCs haven't notified is because they don't have to. And I don't know that ASEAN notifies because who notices if they don't notify, you know? So I think your developed economies notify more than developing economies notify. So I think the era of big deals is not over because that's what companies need. Bilateral deals are pointless. We just don't, don't do that. Does the TPP without the U.S. make sense? Of course it makes sense. The U.S., this is the problem with the TPP. What did the United States deliver in the TPP in terms of its commitments? Very little. It delivered a lot on textiles, a lot on footwear, a little bit on food. Everything else, the United States is already, they already have low tariffs. They already have market access on services, on investment. They already, the entire rule book, basically the TPP matches the U.S. rule book. So the U.S. steps out of the way. If you're from Asia trying to get into the U.S. market, what have you lost? Very little. If you are in the U.S. trying to access everybody else, you've lost a ton. This is disastrous if you sit in Kansas and you want to access everybody else. Horrible. But if you are here going into the U.S., you've lost very little. If you are in the TPP-11, trying to access the TPP-11, benefits are huge. Inter-TPP-11 trade, the U.S. pried everybody else open, fantastic. Benefits enormous. Moved barriers to goods, services, investment, opened up procurement, opened up competition, changed trade facilitation, benefits enormous. So inter-TPP-11, benefits are huge. As long as you're not sitting in Kansas trying to do it, it's fantastic. So I think there's still benefits in TPP 11, a lot of them. This is a RCEP, to go back to RCEP for a second. This is a single undertaking. So everything is, you know, it's a comprehensive agreement. It all has to be agreed at once. So it's not just tariffs, it's everything. And on services, liberalization is slow because it's mostly, but not entirely, positive list. So some countries that have started to go positive list means I only open up the services sectors that I tell you I'm going to open. So there's 160 subsectors and services. So it's painful for some countries because you have to say, this is a service sector I'm going to open. Food and beverages, I'm going to open these. Um, travel and tourism, I'm only going to open these. If you have not done that in a while, like Australia, Australia said, forget it. We're not going back to positive list. We stopped doing that. We're not doing it again. Australia said, we're going to stay negative. Negative means everything is open unless I tell you otherwise. So we have a word hybrid in our set where some countries are negative, like Australia, some countries are staying positive. It's, so it's a weird hybrid in, in our set. But for those positivist countries, the idea, I think, is going if, we're to, if our suggestion is taken. Here's the first batch of services sectors that we're opening, and then in X number of years, these services sectors will be open, and in X number of years, those services sectors will be open. So a staged list of opening and services. So it will happen over time, gradual, like our likes to do, like our likes to do, but we will open up services sectors. So I think it will be very helpful on services. Um, 
And what does Singapore need to do? They need to get an agreement. <laughs> you need to say, this is a comprehensive agreement. You can't just say yes in one area and not in others. You've got to uh, compromise as needed from everyone. So you can't have wildly high ambition or wildly low ambition. You've got to get an agreement across 16. This is not going to be easy. It requires a lot of political will. So at the end of the day, it's sort of gut check time. Are you prepared to close? And if so, let's get it done. And Singapore has to drive it to the end or it won't happen. It'll be next year. I don't know if Singapore has the capacity to make it because otherwise it would be yet another year of following this workshop around. Thank you. Um, I'm then. I'm going to show you a first point. Yes, NTM is definitely a better way of uh, defining what at least I am trying to address in this paper. And uh, when you look at the data, uh, these are headcounts. But when we look at the headcounts, we have with us up to the six digit level of the export lines that they are affecting. And uh, this is where I'll take uh, Sanjita's query as well on board. These are applicable for all members, these are not binary. The point that I'm trying to make is over here that you see, uh, let's say for example, if, if, if we can uh, pick up a simple measure which, which was brought in by China in the wake of the swine flu and on export of bovine animals, it was taken up, initiated, never withdrawn. So when you look at it from the perspective of an FTA user, how do you realize whether your product will be up against a particular measure in that destination country market? We go by the databases, we look at what's in book, and the problem is very specific because these relate to national standards. And knowledge about national standards is not always available in the international domain. And that's where it becomes exceedingly difficult for exporters particularly in the Chinese market, the end result being they stop using the FTs. So they just avoid using the FTs. Yeah. Uh, what kind of national level actions, uh, Manish, I think the least that countries can do, at least in Arce, it will at least develop a database of you know, what national level uh, restrictions are being maintained by each and every country because in 40% of cases, these are in local languages. One doesn't even get to know what is being written out over there. So, even if at least a database is developed about what is in vogue where, how much of these were withdrawn, and eventually you have to go back to the WTO or maybe to the ADB database on FTS to see how much of these are connected to that. But at least there will be some effort. I don't know whether the ASEP will eventually have a secretariat. Working on it, maybe it will, like the ASEAN Secretary, but there could be an effort to at least develop some knowledge base about what is uh, there on ground, what is not there on ground, so that exporters can work on that. Uh, Malcolm, your query on, uh, yes, you're right, SPS primarily on agriculture and food products. TVT is across the world, like if I read out to you, domestic gas, cooking appliances, television, fireworks you know, um, motor engines, you, you name it and you get it. And, and, and then we always look at the product codes. I mean, out of the 99 two-digit product codes that are covered under the AHS system of classification, these TVTs that are maintained by China would extend to more than 70. Easy. I mean, that's just a back of envelope assumption from the list of 25 measures. So, you know, Trade facilitation question, you know, um, I think this is where I, I come back to the point that DB raised. I think standards are serious business and uh, trade agreements cannot reach this. I mean, much as we can talk about services, investment, all those are fine. But you see, when you focus on tariffs, the, what I cannot understand is that how can tariff negotiations go on without connecting them to standards? Because after all, we are talking about goods exports and market access for goods. And standards affect goods exports. So how can countries pick up their tariff offers based on their comparative advantages without knowing whether the tariff cuts would give them access <coughs> on, on, on the standards curve? So, I mean, today, 
it might very well be, just to give a figurative example, that India egg zone for Basmati rice exposed to China gets the tariff cut without knowing what kind of domestic standard it will run up against. Apart from the fact that Basmati rice cannot be picked up by chopsticks. Because it's not steel. So, I mean, there's a certain degree of practicality and pragmatism which has to come into the negotiating speech on this. And this is where I think uh, the industry inputs are extremely important because they are inputs which policy leaders will not be able to figure out because these informations are not existing. They are existing all over, but probably not in as much of a comprehensive form as they should have been. Or could have been. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, uh, very inspiring questions. And let's first ask this uh, the question about uh, uh, what can, well, if you look at China a little bit, uh, what kind of the uh, proposals they can build on? I think that you answer it directly. I think that Alma and China do not, does not have really a very s s strong Chinese FT investment model. Uh, if you want to frame that, it's largely China follow after. And now increasingly affected by the U.S. approach, uh, but since the U.S.-China bid negotiation has been paused, uh, partially because uh, U.S. is not happy that four American businesses go into China, so that's understandable for that context. So China probably move forward uh, more with the EU recently. Uh, it's likely to be uh, affected by the EU proposals, and, and also you see already discussion of the social issues. Uh, which China and, and will discuss over the use one. China will not have those kind of proposals in previous agreements. And the second one is about uh, ISDS, the investment state dispute resolution, and what kind of law they apply, the English law or arbitration. And basically, uh, for the ISDS, they will um, apply the rules of the FTA, free trade agreements, or bilateral investment treaty, or trilateral one between China, Korea, and Japan. So, uh, so they will look more about F, uh, the investment agreements. Um, and if you see what are the FTAs come from, again, currently China's FTAs or investment agreements are largely followed after. For example, one of the major FT, uh, investment agreements China concluded recently was with uh, Canada, the China Canadian uh, Bilateral Investment Treaty in 2012. So that's largely followed Canadian one with some exceptions. And also, uh, um, and also recently, as China, Korea, FTA, and Chafta, they're, they're kind of shaped by Korea or Australia one. And even Korea, Australia ones are not totally different from the US approach. So largely, they still be affected by US one, uh, directly or indirectly. And, uh, um, and also, the, uh, the third question, uh, Professor Ayres, about uh, um, if they have uh, different uh, norms of uh, hygienist genes for agricultural products and what kind of standards it will take, especially vulnerable effects or the contradiction of legal laws. Uh, the, the, if we want to oversimplify that, you should take the highest standards uh, for SGS and CBT or whatever. But I want to caution that in reality, if we look at the FT obligations, they do not really give very detailed uh, obligation for specific products or specific sector. Practice to give the general ideas of, for example, you should build upon what happens, you should build upon the WTO norms, SPS and TBT agreements of the WTO World Travel Organization. And even you look at TBT, uh, TBP, they don't really progress very far away beyond what WTO has really reached because it's a very delicate area. People are not very sure about jurisprudence of that. Besides, they want to build upon scientific evidence. And so they still have a lot of uh, rules for it to maneuver. Uh, they provide for uh, mutual recognition, frequency, but they are all general ones. And also I want to mention about that, um, and also secondly, um, usually there's no need to change the law. So for example, the, 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 these agreements, you don't require to change your domestic law, so they are all at the discretion of government agencies. How do you enforce the rules, SPS, and TBT standards? So that's, uh, that's not so difficult. The government has maneuver rule because they don't have obligations strictly uh, imposed. And also usually, in reality, the government will be relevant be consulted when they reach this FTA, so they have bear in mind what I have to negotiate before, what we negotiate for next one. And on the other hand, there's no need to change the law. So, uh, so generally speaking, quite, uh, it's, it's, 
it's not a big problem if vis-a-vis uh, -vis origin rules where you have a much more detailed application on the FTA. That's been more problematic. And then the next question, the fourth question about uh, whether um, the FTA can be taken by other countries or can they do a side business. Um, the basic question, uh, they have two sides of the story. Why it's difficult? Because they have a rules regime to make sure that uh, either for goods or for services, where they want to make sure that outsiders will not benefit from that. Uh, for example, if you look at China's FTA before China, mainland China and Hong Kong, or Macau, they even have very strict rule for original rule for services provider. So how many years you operate in Hong Kong, and whether you pay for taxation of your income. So it's difficult to evade in that sense. On the other hand, I think it's possible as well, um, because uh, if you already agree on a high treatment, a better treatment with another country on FTA, you may be extend that to other country because you already liberalized or open up your market. So that helps to explain that it is was reported that Pakistan complained about China, saying that uh, the FTA under China, Pakistan FTA, the treatment has already been afforded to other parties. So they don't really have to be a preferential in that sense. Yeah. So it shows this possibility where you know, increased expansion of the benefit to long parties. Yeah. So that may get back to the issue whether you want to operate the FTA give more benefits. And the final question uh, is about the um, uh, RCN. I agree that RCN Comprehensive Investment Agreements deals more about protection rather than investment liberalization. But I, I still think that some RCN seems to be move faster of, or, or be more prepared to take investment liberalization than China. So China, until very recently, until the China uh, set out the, uh, the, this year, China mainland China and Hong Kong uh, uh, close economic partnership arrangement adopt the negative list. Before that, there is no negative list approach taken in China's uh, FTAs. So I would say that RCEP could be a more influence on China as a model, or because it's the first one China who is outsider, but not within one country, to adopt negative list if they'll happen smoothly. And for RC, I think it's already taken that, so it's not so strong impact here. So there will be more impact on China instead of the other ones. I don't add a footnote here. China basically, uh, even if the US-China does not move that's not move on, China won't make that happen because that's important for China to provide predictability to attract foreign investment. So that's what happened in the story. Even US-China negotiation stopped. China still adopts them all and they will have the negative list in 2018 national wide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pranav, uh, you want to make your comment? I cut you short and I apologize, but please. Uh, please. Just, uh, I, on, I mean, Tendul's point on NTVs, and he has very nicely presented the, uh, all the data about the notification, but there is a positive side of it also, because that is, which means the countries are getting more transparent, they are getting information also. And somebody raised the question of uh, personal national response, basically. So in India, at least, the Department of Commerce has the appointed one model agencies to download all those uh, uh, notification on daily basis, analyze, share with the industry members, and then India prepares a response and submit to the WTO. So that is one way of doing it. And secondly, on, as you rightly mentioned about that uh, standard side, equally important, I would say more important, because you get difference on tariff by there is no difference on the standard. Standards we have to comply with, uh, and that is a very, very challenging. And once you, when we talked about harmonization of standard, that is also not going to take you too far because you can harmonize once, and a standard again is a very dynamic process. Every two years, three years, five years, you confront with the new situations. So this is really challenging. How to tackle it? Of course, we have to define in a device and mechanism. Thank you very much. Uh, please. <laughs> No, no question, just uh, some information and comments. Uh, it will be clear. Uh, uh, recently, the uh, one Japanese, uh, I remember his name is uh, Kawasaki. He has an estimation of the impact of the uh, DPP 11 on the Asia Pacific uh, economies. And of course, the impact much less than DPP 12, but uh, why is it? But uh, for example, in the case of Vietnam, you know, impact is only one thing. 
more and more than DPP is about institutional reform, domestic reform. Because if you look at the uh, uh, 29 chapter of DPP, uh, basically most of the chapter uh, about the uh, behind the water. So basically DPP is less about reform. Right? So that's important. And uh, it did it also a template or any kind of actor in arrangement, he will, he will uh, follow the APEC process. Right? Now APEC is set the uh, target for the FDAP. And one thing is uh, we need to have uh, the so-called NG new generation of trade and investment organization. So I think in, in, in your case, that's very good if you look at that one, you know, China, ASEAN, Akia, whatever we have already said. The task for the on twenty one economy to have a, a study on that. Right? And they have different states. There's a one N G E I B next generation of trade investment organization. Right? Uh, about RCEP. Ah, okay, about DPP 11. Ah, they already gathered in Hanoi in May, and I went with them and two weeks ago. So, uh, on the 11 country, uh, uh, you know, they have consensus they need to realize <coughs> So, uh, I hope that at the APEC uh, summit in November, in Dana, in Hanoi, I in Vietnam, the leader, uh, the, the minister, they will, uh, the leader and the minister, they will have final decision in the uh, uh, good, you know, good way for the PPP uh, 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 eleven. Okay, about RCEP. Paradox for RCEP is that right now we understand RCEP should be, you know, the negotiation should be completed by the end of this year with a substantive framework. Uh, agreement. Uh, and we understand RCEP is catalyst in a way for the Asia Pacific integration. But at the same time, in perception of most economies, most people in the region, they are quite pessimistic about RCEP. Right. You know, I, I, uh, last when I was in Washington, they raised the question at the symposium, which which part in the <coughs> momentum for Asia Pacific integration over the last ten years, and most people just say number one, Okinawa, number two, DDP. Very few people in our action are seeing so many things we need to do for the ASEAN. Thank you. Um, well, it's now exactly 12.30, and we started late, but there's time for one more question, but short and sharp, so two more questions, but really short, otherwise we don't do much. Anybody? Great. We've had a fabulous session on... Uh, I'm telling you, no, this is, these are obviously not last words, but I just wanted to... Uh, I have one question for you. Um, how, how do you measure the, uh, the FDM? Of guy, of, of the, the WTO has a database. It maintains those uh, NTMs that individual WTO members have notified to the WTO. You know, the most recent study of NTMs uh, for ASEAN countries just done last year, last year, and it found and the key conclusion is that. The key thing is not NPM themselves. The problem is a procedure. Problem is what? Procedure. Procedure. The key. Yeah, they, they have used the procedure. See, uh, uh, my my uh, my yes. comment on RCEP in this case is that uh, and I will just try to put it in the perspective of the fact that an early conclusion of RCEP is now a priority for the region. I think one can look at it in two aspects. One is the asset can be looked at a project which 
consolidates the sanctity and significance of the ASEAN architecture in the region. And as Debbie put forward, it is an ASEAN plus project. In that respect, there's a great degree of significance of ASEAN. But if we look at ASEAN as a trade agreement, then I'm afraid we need to be much more objective about it, purely as a trade agreement. And this is where there is a disconnect. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I think we've had a really great session. And there are several takeaways that you could, you could have. I just want to uh, point uh, properly. Uh, the first is that um, it makes sense to continue with the thrust towards liberalization, and these mega regions have a role, and they're less distortionary than the bilateral. And that was kind of one point that comes up. The second point um, is really about these NTMs, um, is that these are a major barrier to realizing gains from these agreements, and it's good to try to bring the NTM discussion squarely into the negotiations uh, of our set, for instance. Uh, as well as look at national actions, uh, such as a database that might be useful going forward, and indeed uh, educating firms um, on how to deal with procedures, which just came up a second ago. Uh, so I think we have to do a lot of work on the NTMs, because it's not just about the RCEP, but about other bilaterals, where we see a lot of activity about the NTMs and complaints by business that they don't get any gains, because we haven't dealt with the stuff that's um, you know, out there, uh, and anything in the room, which is the NTM. On the investment um, agreements, um, one of the interesting things I picked up from your uh, presentation uh, is that China's approach to investment uh, is evolving. And I think that's a really good uh, thing, given that China is probably one of the largest of the investors now in Asia, uh, and it's probably going to drive the next generation of value chains going forward. So we have to think of ways to deal with the frictions uh, that might come on a bilateral level on a regional basis from these investment agreements. Um, and it was kind of heartening to know that the Australia-China discussions uh, kind of lay some standards there uh, for China to look at in the future. And uh, perhaps eventually, uh, you know, these will get put back into our set and to other fora and China's agreement. So I think that's really interesting. I think we need to do a lot of education also on the uh, investment agreement. So I think we've had a really great session. Please give our panelists a great time.